fortunate to be introducing Bernard Dickens to you. He is Professor Emeritus of Health Law at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law. He's also co-director of the International Reproductive and Sexual Health Law Program at the University of Toronto. Uh, he is as well and the he is Professor Emeritus, there's so much on here that it's hard to, he's Professor Emeritus also of the Faculty of Medicine and the Joint Centre for Bioethics at University of Toronto. It's hard to know how to limit myself in this introduction and not to be too effusive, um, but one is awestruck reading his biography. Um, for one thing, he has two real doctorates as well as some honorary ones. Um, one doctorate is in law and criminology and the other is in medical jurisprudence. Um, Bernard is co-editor of a number of international journals all to do with health law. He chairs the Ethics Advisory Committee of the Public Health Agency of Canada. He's both a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, which is a very high distinction, and likewise a very high distinction. He's an officer of the Order of Canada. Uh, he has, uh, oh, just way, way too many <laughs> for one person, publications and committee service, both in Canada and internationally. If I kept outlining even in brief for you, we would be up to 1.30 and the seminar would be done. Um, so I'm about to give Bernard the floor, but I just want to mention two more things. One is that he chairs the Ethics Committee for the International Federation of Gynecology and Obs Obstetrics, and this informs the topic of today, which, as you likely see there, is the legal scope and limits of conscientious objection by healthcare providers. So please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. I'm very pleased and honoured to, uh, to be here. I'm grateful to Professor Gibson for the opportunity to, to be here, really uh, coming back uh, to a much more charming room than I was in uh, last time. Uh, also, for, for a very generous introduction, I'm sorry that my, my parents weren't here to, uh, uh, to hear it. <laughs> the, uh, the topic is, is the one that you see, uh, conscientious objection. Uh, and this really is rooted uh, both internationally and domestically. Internationally, uh, it's identified in the International Covenant of, on Civil and Political Rights. Uh, but to give domestic effect uh, to this legally binding international treaty, uh, we have the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, which is rooted in the International Covenant, and it repeats many of the same uh, governing principles. And the first one that we have to look at uh, is the one that you have, that everyone should have the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. And this right shall include various freedoms of public and private uh, demonstration of convictions, uh, but also the right to manifest his religion or belief in worship, observance, practice, and teaching. The International uh, Covenant uh, goes back to drafting in the 1960s, uh, today, of course, it would be quite unacceptable uh, to identify just the male gender. Uh, modern documents uh, wouldn't say to manifest his religion. It might be in the plural that people had the right to manifest their religion, uh, or it might uh, uh, be uh, gender inclusive. Uh, but uh, this is a, a document that we have. The importance of it uh, initially is twofold. The first is that it distinguishes conscience from religion. Uh, that is, conscience is separate from religion. We know, of course, that much conscience is guided by religion. Uh, many people draw on their religious convictions uh, to shape their conscience. But conscience is not limited to religion. Religion does not have a monopoly on conscience. Uh, the conscience can be guided uh, by uh, a personal philosophy, uh, a social conviction, uh, an economic conviction, uh, and uh, one's uh, uh, personal belief system. 
So the first point to note uh, is that we are dealing with conscience and although much of the emphasis in my talk this morning is going to be on religiously directed conscience, uh, we have to remember that conscience is separate. It is not dependent upon a belief uh, in uh, 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 divine uh, guidance. Uh, it can come from secular, uh, more mundane convictions. The second point is to note that uh, religion itself is subject to assessment by reference to conscience. Uh, that is, uh, one can conscientiously scrutinize and even criticize uh, the way religious institutions exercise their freedom. Freedom of religion uh, is very important uh, because it's part of a personal identity. But uh, when we recognize that the International Covenant uh, has its domestic impact uh, through the Canadian Charter and also the decision of the Supreme Court that when governments delegate functions to hospitals, uh, the hospitals uh, have to implement the government's obligations under the Charter. Uh, we recognize that uh, there can be quasi-governmental charter implications for the way hospitals operate. But because of uh, the uh, freedom enjoyed by religious institutions, uh, they are permitted to deviate from what otherwise would be requirements under the federal charter and under provincial human rights codes. Those codes, for example, prohibit discrimination on grounds of sex or gender. Uh, they equally prohibit uh, discrimination on grounds of marital status. Uh, and, of course, uh, they tend to uh, uh, prohibit discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation. But religious institutions, uh, because the government keeps its hands off them, are permitted to uh, limit, uh, for example, ordination of ministers uh, to men and not women. And although uh, most visible in this regard is the Catholic Church, uh, we have to recognize that Orthodox Judaism uh, and branches of Islam uh, do not ordain women. Uh, to that extent, the, uh, the practices uh, of these institutions in their, in their private uh, exercise of freedom of religion are permitted to do uh, what other institutions would not be permitted to do. Equally, of course, uh, the Catholic Church uh, does not undertake the marriage uh, of people who have been divorced. Uh, this is discrimination on grounds of marital status. And, of course, the, uh, the Church is not just a Catholic, have been in the forefront of resistance to same-sex marriage. So there are a variety of discriminatory practices in violation of our human rights codes that we tolerate uh, for the exercise of freedom of religion. Uh, this becomes an important value. Of course, a background question is whether <coughs> these institutions uh, that violate our human rights codes uh, ought to enjoy tax immunities on their income and their land, uh, but that's not an issue that we need to address now. There is a limit uh, on the exercise, uh, not just of thought and conscience, but particularly uh, of religion, because of Article 18.3. This provides that freedom to manifest one's religion or beliefs may be subject only to such limitations as are prescribed by law and are necessary to protect, the full quotation is to protect public safety, order, health or morals, or the fundamental rights and freedoms of others. The point is that uh, freedom to uh, engage in one's own thoughts and one's own uh, conscientious convictions and one's religion uh, is acceptable as an internal private matter. But the exercise of, in the language, uh, religion or beliefs uh, in a public manifestation can be limited by law. Uh, that is, uh, under the rule of law, uh, there can be legitimate limits. Now, this is something that we're familiar with uh, in the context of the Charter. That is, freedom to profess uh, thought, conscience and religion but in particular freedom to profess a conscience uh, is absolute. 
but freedom to act on uh, one's conviction, that is to manifest religion or beliefs, uh, can be limited uh, by the rights of others. And this requires a balance, uh, that is balancing which rights can prevail over other equally legitimate rights. And this balancing is something that we're familiar with uh, in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Uh, the Charter begins with, as you would expect numerically, Section 1, uh, and uh, the fact that it is Section 1 is important because that provides in a very crude uh, 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 synthesis uh, that you, have, you are guaranteed to enjoy all of the following rights and freedoms unless you are not. And you would not be free to enjoy them uh, because they are subject in the language of Section 1 of the Charter, subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law uh, as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. So one can think what one wants, one can move uh, in accordance one's, uh, with one's uh, conscientious values, and one can also maintain one's religious beliefs. But to manifest religious or other beliefs uh, can be limited uh, under the law. And so the balancing exercise is one that we are familiar with uh, at the international level under the International Covenant and domestically in Canada uh, because of the impact of Section 9. Underlying this is that uh, one's religious convictions uh, are essentially private and we know that private institutions, uh, perhaps subject to provincial human rights codes, uh, can discriminate. These are the points that I've made in the context of religion, but it applies equally to, uh, to private uh, associations. Uh, we've recently seen in the sporting field uh, that a well-publicized uh, golf club in the United States uh, has changed its rules and actually permitted the inclusion of women. Uh, the exclusion of women until about two weeks ago uh, was not unlawful. As a private institution, they were entitled uh, to exercise that judgment. The difficulty that we have in the health context, however, is that licensed health professionals enjoy a legal monopoly. Uh, that is, uh, there would be provincial offences uh, for the unlicensed, unqualified practice of medicine and certain other health professionals. And uh, the discharge of professional functions has a public aspect and it raises questions uh, of whether it is a, an abuse of monopoly uh, granted by law uh, that practitioners in a given area all exercise conscientious objection uh, with the effect and sometimes one could suspect the purpose of making particular medical procedures inaccessible uh, to those who depend on them that is, those who don't have the means, the money, the leisure, uh, to go elsewhere uh, for treatment. So one has uh, difficulties in this regard. Conscientious objection is limited to direct participation in procedures, uh, but uh, in order to accommodate freedom of conscience, uh, employers are expected to uh, maximize uh, individuals' capacity to exercise their freedom of conscience. Uh, but this is limited to direct participation in procedures uh, such as abortion, uh, contraceptive sterilization, uh, the uh, prescription of contraceptive drugs, uh, emergency contraception, and also uh, not to limit ourselves to the beginning of life uh, there are conscientious objections uh, to many end-of-life procedures. Uh, that is, uh, there can be uh, control and there can be objection uh, of withdrawing uh, uh, dependent people's uh, access to uh, nutrition and hydration, so-called terminal sedation. Uh, some see as analogous to killing patients and they find it objectionable. And although my focus is on the beginning of life, uh, we have to remember that we have the full spectrum of life experiences uh, that can offend uh, individual conscience, particularly religious conscience. And this ought to be accommodated uh, because of the respect that we have to give 
uh, to freedom of conscience, including freedom of religious conscience. There is an exception, except where a woman's life or permanent health is in danger. We are dealing essentially, of course, with women in the reproductive field. Uh, but this is not uh, to say that one's religious conscience or one's conscience uh, motivated by other incentives uh, is limited to a, a religion. Uh, this is not uh, too much of a difficulty, though, uh, where uh, survival, life, and the uh, uh, preservation of uh, permanent health uh, is at risk. Uh, because of the philosophical doctrine accepted, for example, by the Catholic Church of double effect. Uh, that is, uh, if one uh, finds a woman's life endangered by continuation of pregnancy, then terminating the pregnancy uh, may in effect be abortion, but it would be characterized as a life-saving intervention uh, the secondary effect may be unavoidable, but it's not the primary purpose, it's not intended. Uh, the analogy in the male field is if a man has uh, cancer of the testicles, the testicles are removed and he becomes sterile. Uh, but that's not a sterilization procedure, uh, that's a life-saving procedure. Uh, and uh, in that sense, uh, the doctrine of double effect means that uh, individuals' lives and permanent health are not sacrificed uh, to religious convictions. In the reproductive health field, uh, just as a side issue, uh, there are now uh, experiments with uh, uh, the uh, uh, donation, the transfer of testicles, uh, so that a man who loses uh, his uh, ability to uh, fertilize an ovum uh, can in fact father a child uh, by organ transplant. Uh, there's an interesting question uh, of whose child that would be. Is it the child of the man who receives the, uh, the testicles or the man who donated them? Uh, but that's for another class. <laughs> the uh, fact that uh, religious institutions uh, can uh, object to procedures uh, has of course been litigated more in the United States and Canada uh, but there was a case in 1989 the case of Brownfield against the Daniel Friedman uh, 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 Marina Hospital uh, in California where marinas are uh, Brownfield against the Daniel Friedman Marina Hospital a decision of the California Court of Appeal in 1989 involving a rape victim uh, who was treated, uh, but she wasn't offered uh, what we would call emergency contraception. And she went to court to seek a declaration, not seeking uh, compensation, uh, but saying that uh, she was not dealt with in accordance with the legally required standard of care uh, because the Catholic Hospital's emergency department uh, uh, not only uh, did not have means of emergency contraception, but didn't tell her that that was a legitimate option uh, and refer her to another institution. The California Court of Appeal said that that was a breach of the required standard of care and the hospital was required and has uh, reluctantly accepted uh, that in its rape crisis centre uh, it will provide uh, either emergency contraception or prompt referral. And it really makes the point uh, that when institutions are discharging a public function, uh, then uh, they have to meet public standards, even if their religious convictions uh, are to the contrary. The accommodation then of conscientious objection is to direct participation in procedures if we're thinking about surgical abortion, or even for that matter, medical abortion, or sometimes called medication abortion, non-surgical abortion, uh, those who would be directly involved are entitled to the protection of their conscience uh, by uh, exemption from uh, liability. In the Brownfield case, uh, the Catholic hospital uh, invoked its protection against undertaking abortion procedures. But the court determined uh, that abortion is not simply a medical matter, it is a legal matter, and uh, emergency contraception 
was designed to and operated to prevent pregnancy. It was not abortion and therefore the hospital couldn't invoke its uh, immunity from having to undertake abortion. But if one is dealing with, for example, surgery uh, to terminate a pregnancy or for a tubal ligation, a sterilization procedure, uh, then those who otherwise would be expected to do it, uh, gynecologists, uh, are entitled to invoke their religious protection, their protection of their religious conscience. Equally, uh, operating theatre nurses uh, who find this objectionable uh, are entitled to say that this is a practice they will not undertake. And we're going to make the point uh, that when health professionals disclose in advance uh, to potential employers uh, the practices within the scope of their specialty that they decline to undertake on grounds of conscience, uh, they are protected by uh, 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 against uh, discriminatory practices. Uh, that is, they can't be refused a job uh, because of their religious conscience. In most cases, there may be exceptions. If, for example, a hospital finds that all of its uh, obstetricians, gynecologists, uh, will decline to undertake certain procedures, and the hospital uh, has a community dependent on that hospital for services that existing staff members decline to undertake, then, of course, it becomes a bona fide condition of future employment uh, that a future applicant will undertake the procedures that the hospital is obliged to make available. And if its existing staff uh, uh, create uh, barriers to that, uh, the hospital overcomes those barriers and it can then select who it will recruit. And, of course, a condition of employment uh, is that the practitioners will undertake uh, what certain of their colleagues uh, refuse to undertake. But there is uh, an obligation on the part of employers generally uh, to be reasonably accommodating uh, of the conscientious convictions, religious or otherwise, uh, of uh, potential and actual staff members. The protection, though, is of uh, direct involvement. I mentioned surgeons, uh, also operating theatre nurses, uh, anaesthetists uh, can uh, decline. Uh, more contentious is the role of pharmacists, whether in hospitals or in the, in the general community. Uh, we know that a lot of objection to filling contraceptive uh, uh, prescriptions uh, not just emergency contraception, not just medication abortion, but routine contraception uh, will be rejected by some pharmacists. Uh, and if they refer uh, the applicants for those uh, prescriptions being filled to other reasonably accessible pharmacists, uh, then this is accepted. But there was a case before the European Court of Human Rights involving uh, pharmacists, uh, two pharmacists, husband and wife couple, in a fairly remote area of France uh, who refused to fill contraceptive prescriptions uh, and uh, they were disciplined under the consumers' rights legislation of France and they appealed against that to the European Court of Human Rights. And the European Court said that because of the, uh, the isolation uh, of their location and because uh, women needed uh, these procedures within a short time and didn't have the means to travel distances uh, to other available sources, uh, the, uh, the pharmacists were not free to exercise their religious convictions against filling uh, the uh, prescription for contraception. This is the sort of thing that in practice one would hope to accommodate uh, in an area uh, such as an urban centre where there are alternative uh, means of recourse and one would expect pharmacists who refuse to fill formula to, uh, to uh, 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 complete uh, prescriptions uh, to refer their patients, uh, their potential patients, to other providers. But the European Court said that because of the isolation uh, in this case, uh, the pharmacists were not free to exercise their religious conscience. Uh, the court said that there were many other areas of activity in which they could manifest their religious and conscientious convictions, uh, but not to uh, deny 
treatment to those who needed it. And of course this goes back to Article 18, Subsection 3 of the uh, Convention on Civil and Political Rights. Uh, this is a uh, legitimate limit. The uh, role of nurses uh, becomes difficult in the area uh, of abortion. Uh, I've mentioned that uh, nurses who find this uh, an objectionable procedure are entitled not to take part. Uh, but routine functions would include, for example, uh, with orderlies, uh, but clearing up after surgical procedures. And it is distasteful in a late-term abortion uh, to clear up uh, what uh, results uh, from the uh, dismantling of the limbs uh, of the identifiable fetus. This is very distasteful, it's very distressing. And uh, the question is whether uh, nurses who conscientiously object are entitled to place the entire burden of that responsibility on their colleagues, or whether this is something that they have to share equally. Uh, clearly, after the procedure is undertaken, tidying up after it is not participation. Equally, of course, uh, there are objections uh, that have come up in, uh, in uh, uh, Latin America uh, to admitting uh, patients for abortion procedures. And there are two decisions of 2006 and 2008 of the Constitutional Court of Colombia uh, that are very graphic in this regard. Uh, the uh, Constitutional Court of Colombia uh, made it clear uh, that hospital administrators are not direct participants in the procedures they facilitate. Uh, that is, uh, admitting patients for objectionable procedures, uh, procedures that the admitting officer finds personally objectionable, is not direct participation, and it does not accommodate a, a conscientious objection. Uh, equally, scheduling surgery uh, that one finds objectionable is not direct participation. So one can't discriminate on the basis of procedures that patients are going to have or that patients have had. Uh, this is not participation. There's an interesting case that is likely to go forward uh, from the United Kingdom, from Scotland. An interesting case decided in February of this year uh, in the Scottish Trial Court, the Court of Session, uh, that is likely to be appealed to higher levels through the appeal courts, even finally to what used to be what I still think of as the House of Lords, uh, which of course is now uh, properly described as the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. Uh, the case involved two midwives, uh, devout Catholics, uh, who worked at a facility uh, where they were in charge of midwifery supervision uh, guidance, instruction, support uh, of midwives and uh, a limited number of abortions were done uh, and that was accommodated. But because of a change in health service delivery within Scotland, uh, the hospital in Glasgow became the primary centre for abortion services and the nurses with support of an outside agency, the Society for the Protection of the Unborn Child, SPUC, uh, litigated uh, against disciplinary proceedings uh, where they were found in breach of their terms of employment uh, that required them to supervise midwives, uh, a number of whom were involved in abortion procedures. And the two uh, senior administrative midwives uh, objected that this was a violation of their conscience, it was against their convictions. Uh, the difficulty was that each of them uh, under renewed terms of employment had voluntarily accepted uh, to discharge their functions of supervising midwives, knowing that many of them were involved uh, quite directly in termination of, of uh, pregnancies. Uh, and uh, it was found that the disciplinary sanctions, one of them had actually taken another job, uh, the other hadn't and was unemployed, but it was held that the disciplinary sanctions against them were appropriate uh, because they were obliged to discharge the employment terms to which they had voluntarily committed themselves uh, and uh, uh, they were uh, clearly in breach. 
this was a form of, if you like, a conscientious martyrdom. Uh, but the proposal of the SPUC, the Society for the Protection of the Unborn Child, uh, have said that they intend to take the case further, uh, and we'll have to see uh, uh, where, uh, where it goes. The, uh, the involvement of nurses, uh, as I was about to say, is uh, significant because a number of uh, terminations of pregnancy are conducted by a saline injection or the use of uh, prostaglandin techniques and those involve doctors inserting the catheter into the woman's abdomen but it's in the nurses uh, who administer the, uh, the drugs and uh, uh, moderate the, uh, the, uh, the flow of the drugs and of course deal with the consequences, the expulsion of contents of the uterus. And this was litigated uh, in the United Kingdom uh, in uh, the late 1980s uh, because the Royal College of Nurses, on behalf of nurses, uh, said that this leaves nurses vulnerable to prosecution uh, because the United Kingdom Abortion Act of 1967 gave doctors protection but it didn't protect anyone other than doctors in the language of the statute. And the nurses said because they are uh, uh, hands-on conducting the abortion procedure, uh, they could be vulnerable to, in the United Kingdom law, uh, the Offences Against the Person Act of 1861. Uh, abortion is punishable with up to life imprisonment. And the Royal College of Nurses, uh, perhaps in a, in a challenge, uh, said that uh, this leaves nurses vulnerable and they are not obliged to uh, implement uh, procedures that leave them vulnerable to these sanctions uh, without regard to a personal conscience. The highest court at that time, the House of Lords, uh, ruled that those who are acting under doctor's direction, uh, that is nurses, are covered by the doctor's immunity uh, and therefore these procedures uh, uh, would leave the nurses uh, immune from legal liability. But because they clearly are involved, uh, they have the freedom of conscience to object. And in those circumstances, uh, nurses can object uh, to this level of direct participation. This is in contrast to other nursing functions, uh, serving meals, making beds, uh, looking after the general hygiene of patients, uh, that does not attract uh, uh, conscientious objection. Uh, that is, those who have to prepare patients for medical procedures, not necessarily immediately preoperative, that can be seen as part of uh, the uh, direct uh, uh, procedure, uh, but those who undertake auxiliary services before or after surgery uh, cannot uh, uh, invoke uh, rights of conscientious objection. Institutions such as hospitals uh, do not have a human right to claim conscientious objection. Now, this is a point that's been contested, but it was clarified for international purposes by the two decisions of the Supreme, I beg your pardon, the Constitutional Court of uh, Colombia, uh, the 2006, amplified in the 2008 decisions, uh, saying that institutions such as hospitals or clinics uh, cannot uh, invoke the human right uh, to claim conscientious objection. Whether institutions uh, can claim conscientious objection uh, is uh, something that has been uh, contested under international human rights provisions, uh, both the European Court of Human Rights and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights uh, have grappled with this issue but have come to uh, the general assessment that ecclesiastical institutions, church-based or religious institutions, churches, mosques, synagogues, uh, are entitled to freedom of religion and they can uh, choose, uh, for example, uh, who they are going to permit uh, to discharge their religious functions and obviously they want adherence uh, to the religion they profess. But institutions uh, that are secular, uh, community institutions, uh, cannot invoke uh, institutional rights of conscientious objection. Obviously, hospitals are not licensed to practice medicine. Uh, that is, 
uh, they are not direct participants in the procedures they accommodate and facilitate. Uh, and uh, in that sense, uh, they are not free as institutions uh, to uh, regulate uh, uh, particular procedures uh, on grounds of conscience. Of course, we tend to focus here uh, on, uh, in particular, Roman Catholic hospitals. They're very visible. Uh, they're dominant in many areas uh, in the United States uh, because of the, uh, the burdens, the financial burdens of hospital management. There have been a number of mergers, and Catholic hospitals have the resources of the Catholic Church behind them, although, of course, many of the services that they discharge uh, are reimbursed by provincial health plans and they therefore receive uh, vast volumes of public money. Uh, estimates uh, for 2002 uh, were that Catholic hospitals in the United States of America in 2002, the last year for which we have figures, received $45 billion of public money through Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, so they're very much involved in health care and the conscience of Catholic bishops is very vocal uh, regarding the organization of hospitals. But if, for example, uh, another Christian denomination, if Jehovah's Witnesses had the funds, which they do not, to run hospitals, uh, we have to ask whether it would be acceptable uh, that an entire region was dependent on services uh, from the Jehovah's Witness Hospital that undertook surgery but would not undertake blood transfusion or the use of blood products. Uh, could a community be made dependent on a hospital uh, that refused to undertake blood transfusion. And if not, uh, then how can we rationalize uh, whole communities being dependent on hospitals uh, that won't undertake medically indicated terminations of pregnancy, uh, sterilization procedures, uh, abortion procedures, or comfortable, dignified end-of-life procedures? Uh, this is a challenge that we have to, uh, to grapple with. We know that there are fiduciary duties uh, binding uh, health professionals. The Supreme Court in 1992, McInerney and MacDonald, uh, established that uh, the doctor-patient relationship uh, does involve fiduciary duties. And this is true in the United States and in Australia. Uh, it's an interesting historical point uh, that uh, certainly England within the United Kingdom does not accept that the doctor-patient relationship is fiduciary. Uh, this is something that has been uh, denied and resisted uh, and quite why uh, North America has moved to accept this nature of the relationship uh, is historically an interesting point. But the Supreme Court has made it clear uh, that uh, Canadian providers uh, are bound by fiduciary duties. And these duties involve at least three elements. Uh, the first is that uh, when practitioners uh, within the scope of their medical specialty will decline to undertake procedures reasonably expected of them, they ought to tell uh, potential patients and in particular potential employers. Uh, that is, uh, they can't be discriminated against on ground of their religious faith, but if a hospital uh, finds that it has to discharge certain procedures uh, that its existing staff object to, uh, then that will be relevant to subsequent appointments because it must recruit personnel uh, to undertake the services indicated by the, uh, the catchment area, uh, the population of the catchment area the hospital serves. So uh, the first obligation is to disclose in advance the procedures that one declines on grounds of conscience that may be religious or other uh, to, uh, to undertake. Uh, the second uh, is the obligation, part of routine informed, free and informed consent in the doctor-patient relationship. Uh, the uh, patients uh, are entitled to uh, relevant information concerning options available to them. And uh, part of the fiduciary duty of the health professional is to inform patients of all medically indicated options for their care, including those uh, in which the individual practitioner uh, declines to participate. Uh, that is, uh, denying the patient a service is legitimate. Denying the patient information of medically indicated services is not acceptable. 
uh, that is a limit uh, on freedom of conscience. One must disclose the procedures uh, that one won't undertake. And then uh, what I described as the key compromise is the duty to refer. Uh, that is, uh, if services are not going to be ma made available by an individual practitioner or by an institution, uh, suppose the institution is free to uh, decline services, uh, then uh, there must be referral to appropriate others. That is also part uh, of the balance, the compromise, uh, between respecting individual conscience, religious or otherwise, and also ensuring that uh, others are entitled to exercise their right of access to medically indicated uh, wanted health procedures. So important obligations, uh, that is uh, first of all to uh, tell potential patients and employers uh, the services within one specialty that one objects to perform, uh, the obligation to inform patients of all procedures indicated uh, on an objective medical basis without regard to the willingness of the individual to participate in those procedures and the obligation to refer. This is sometimes uh, opposed on religious grounds because of the religious concepts of complicity, uh, the, uh, the doctrine that it is as offensive uh, to refer to others uh, for a procedure as it is oneself to undertake the procedure. But we have to remember uh, that even abortion referrals are not referrals for abortion. There are referrals uh, to uh, others who will consider uh, whether the procedure is indicated or not. Uh, some time ago, two years ago now, uh, I was at a, a clinic, the only clinic in uh, uh, Uruguay, Montevideo. It has a small population, the whole population of, Mon of Uruguay is smaller than metropolitan Toronto, it's about three million. Uh, all of the abortions are concentrated in the university hospital. And the hospital had produced figures for uh, 2008, I was there in 2010, and they only had figures for 2008. But they took some pleasure uh, that of all of the cases in the country referred to them, uh, for abortion or in an abortion context, 42% resulted in continuation of the pregnancy. That is, the discussions uh, were not for abortion, they were to consider a range of options of which abortion was simply one. And of course, referral is not participation. Doctors who refer to others for procedures they won't undertake uh, on grounds of skill or on grounds of uh, conscientious objection uh, the doctors who uh, uh, make the referral are not participants in the subsequent discussions and procedures. They don't share fees, uh, that is a fee splitting, a, a, a legal and a, a ethical violation. If the discussions and if the subsequent procedures are conducted negligently, uh, the doctors who refer are not parties to their negligence. Uh, and if the procedure should be criminal, again, the doctors who refer are not participants in that crime. So referral is not participation and it does not attract the right to conscientious objection. The last point I'm going to make is that conscientious objection uh, can include objection to comply uh, with hospitals' restrictive directives. Uh, this is what I, I call a conscientious commitment making the point that religion does not have a monopoly of conscience. Uh, there can be a conscientious conviction, not simply to decline to undertake procedures, but positively to undertake them. Uh, there was a, a, a perspective article in the New England Journal of Medicine this month on the 13th of September uh, called uh, Recognizing Conscience in Abortion Provision uh, that makes the point uh, that respect for conscience ought to be symmetrical. That is, one ought to respect the conscience of those who object to undertake the procedures and equally respect the conscience of those who are willing to undertake those procedures. And that could include uh, in facilities, in hospitals, uh, that uh, claim those procedures are objectionable and immoral. Uh, that is, uh, in the same way that secular non-denominational hospitals have to accommodate the religious conscience of those who object to undertake procedures. 
religiously sponsored hospitals have equally to accommodate the conscientious convictions of those who want to undertake procedures that the hospital itself through its senior management who may not be a doctor may be a bishop uh, finds unacceptable uh, that is uh, if the doctor feels the patients ought to be informed of particular options for their procedure contraceptive options sterilization options termination of pregnancy options uh, the information uh, can legitimately be given and indeed under fiduciary duties must be given uh, notwithstanding the opposition of the uh, administrative management of the institution equally if a doctor feels that a contraceptive prescription is indicated or a prescription for emergency contraception as we've seen in the Brownfield case in the California Court of Appeal or even for, for uh, medication or medical abortion uh, the doctors ought to be free on grounds of their conscience uh, to write that prescription uh, notwithstanding uh, the opposition of the institution that, uh, that employs them equally if they want to undertake procedures uh, that patients want uh, this is something that they ought to be free again conscientiously to undertake if for example a woman at cesarean delivery uh, initiates a discussion for tubal ligation uh, then the surgeon ought to feel free to undertake that procedure uh, and of course uh, if procedures require collaboration of colleagues who will not collaborate uh, such as surgical termination of pregnancy uh, then the doctors have to refer uh, to appropriate other centers so my final point uh, as the clock uh, strikes a minute after one o'clock uh, is that if we truly respect conscience it's not simply the conscience to object uh, though that merits the fullest feasible protection but also the conscience to undertake procedures the patients want uh, that are indicated in the patient's health interests Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Though it's fairly non-contentious, I doubt that there are any uh, uh, questions, but please feel free. <laughs> Is this the complicity? Complicity, yeah, right. Okay. So from their point of view, it is participation. Yes. So, um, so making the argument that, look, really, it isn't participation, therefore, conscientious objection doesn't apply, doesn't that come, it seems to me it misses the whole point of conscience, because conscience from, you know, from the Canadian, you know, Supreme Court point of view, like Ansel, Ansel, um, Ansel, um, said it, it's from their perspective you know we don't we don't impose on them what their conscious beliefs our only test is do they actually believe it and if they actually believe it then we'll give them the freedom to continue believing it so i really see how making an argument saying no it's not really participation therefore conscientious objection doesn't apply when really the test should be do they consciously object to it and if they do then conscious objection because if it's the same thing for them, abortion, abortion, then it seems to me that there shouldn't be a difference in what their duty is. Yes, uh, this, this implicates the, the rule of law. Uh, that is, uh, Article 18.3 uh, says that uh, the exercise of uh, religion or beliefs is subject to the rights and freedoms of others uh, when prescribed by law. 
uh, and doctors and hospitals recognizing that when we speak about prescribed by law, that involves also the declaratory function of the common law. Uh, but because of the fiduciary duties that doctors owe and the, uh, the contractual relationship, if there is one, uh, the uh, obligation to refer is imposed by law. If that offends uh, conscientious convictions based on complicity, uh, then this is a problem uh, within those who hold that conviction. Uh, but that does not entitle the withholding of indicated procedures, uh, the fundamental rights and freedoms of patients who are dependent on those monopolistic uh, professionals uh, for access to care. Uh, the complicity argument is uh, based on extending uh, the, uh, the prohibition of access to services, and that is subject to legal limits. Uh, the, uh, the Catholic Church has said, for example, uh, that uh, uh, with a certain disdain for democratic law, uh, because the Church uh, declares a revealed divine law, uh, one can engage, indeed one can have an obligation to in engage in uh, civil disobedience and defy the law uh, in uh, observance of the so-called higher law. Uh, but that is rejected under the rule of law. When there are legal duties, uh, then they have to be observed. Uh, the courts have said that those uh, required to refer uh, can feel conscientiously uh, discomforted and they can find this a violation of their religious faith. Uh, but the acceptance of uh, this concept of complicity uh, would result in services being denied to those who are legally entitled to them. And this is part of the balance. Uh, that is, the balance uh, uh, favours uh, patients who are dependent on health professionals with a monopoly to, uh, to provide those services. Uh, this is simply a problem uh, that the, uh, the Catholic Church has to accept. In the same way, for example, that the Catholic Hospital in the Brownfield case, uh, under direction of the California Court of Appeal, had to make emergency contraception available, even though within the Catholic uh, conception uh, that could violate uh, its uh, uh, prohibitions of undertaking abortion. Uh, this is simply a limit of accommodation of religious conscience. Well, see, that's my point, is that if from their perspective it's the same thing, Yes, and uh, then it's not really balanced at all because well, you're, you're, you have to arbitrarily say, no, this doesn't make sense, your conscience doesn't make sense at this point, and that's why we're not going to yes, allow uh, this. Yes, and, and those of that conviction should not voluntarily place themselves in positions where others are dependent on them for services, including the referral, they're not willing to undertake. Uh, that is, their choice of profession uh, is subject to a constraint, and they have to decide uh, what to do. Uh, courts uh, have to deal very carefully with this, but at times they're willing to. In 1938, in the leading uh, common law abortion case, the Queen against Bourne, uh, where the court dealt with uh, uh, conscientious objection, the judge perhaps went too far in saying that doctors who hold the belief that they shouldn't undertake those procedures and shouldn't refer for them should not practice clinical medicine. But if they choose to practice clinical medicine and induce uh, a community de to depend on them for services, uh, they can't withhold those services that they can discharge by referral. This is simply a limit if their conscience is agonised by it. Uh, then, as the judge perhaps uh, injudiciously said in 1938, they shouldn't practice clinical medicine. In the same way as the midwives uh, in the Scottish case uh, voluntarily chose a form of employment uh, that they then found compromised their conscience. Uh, they were disciplined and uh, the one who hadn't taken other employment consistent with her conscience uh, was uh, uh, terminated from employment. And that's part of the burden that goes with accepting a religious conscience. It is not absolute. It's subject to limits uh, to preserve the rights and freedoms of others. This is an insoluble uh, conflict, uh, soluble only by individuals not placing themselves in positions where they induce others to depend on them for services uh, that they will deliver only within uh, self-imposed limits. But 
then you don't have the doctor, so you don't have the ball. Uh, I'm sorry. But then you don't have the doctor, so you don't have the ball. But I'll move on. So I'm wondering about the, the last point where you talked about the symmet symmetricity, if that's the word, between um, uh, the, the person that has a conscientious commitment to doing certain kinds of procedures. I'm wondering how practically important this point would be because you you earlier acknowledged that um, you know if somebody signs a contract that says that they will do certain procedures, um, then they're essentially held to have to do them. They can't later have conscientious objections to. And I would think that for in the vast majority of cases, religious hospitals will write into the contract that you will not perform these kinds of procedures while at our hospital. So it, it may end up not being as important. Yes, and this raises questions of uh, equal protection of the law. Uh, that is, uh, can they enforce that contract? Uh, can there actually be religious hospitals? Can there be Catholic hospitals any more than there could be Jehovah's Witness hospitals who could do surgery uh, but uh, deny blood transfusion? Uh, if one accepts equal protection of the law, then in the same way that non-denominational hospitals uh, are required maximally uh, within reasonable limits to accommodate the conscience of those who refuse to undertake procedures. Uh, that is, uh, doctors are engaged, officers and gynecologists are uh, engaged to undertake procedures within the scope of their professional specialty. Uh, but they are allowed to decline procedures. That is also breach of contract, but that is accommodated. Uh, if one accommodates breach of contract by those who refuse to undertake procedures they're committed to, uh, then one ought to accommodate those who undertake procedures that contractually are denied to them. And it raises questions about whether that is uh, a lawful contract or whether it's against public policy. Uh, for example, in December of last year, uh, a hospital murder in the United States, in Kentucky, uh, was a pro proposed between a Catholic and a non-Catholic hospital with the undertaking that the new emerging procedure would be a Catholic hospital. And the governor of Kentucky refused to uh, validate uh, that murder, saying it's against the public interest because it would result in services, particularly to women, reproductive health services, uh, being denied. Uh, so questions of uh, public interest weigh in the balance. Uh, and if there are restrictive clauses of employment in contracts uh, between uh, health professionals and hospitals that have induced whole communities to depend on them for care, uh, then one could have uh, an argument in court uh, that those restrictive clauses are against the public interest and not enforceable. And this is a ground for a uh, legal challenge and contest. I, following directly up on the conversation you just had, um, and I've been wondering even prior to that, about the extent to which your argument depends on whether the whole community is dependent on it. And I was thinking about um, both sides, the conscientious objection side and the conscientious commitment side. Is that a necessary element in your view? Yes, it is. And uh, at the risk of being parochial, uh, this is an issue that arose in Toronto uh, when uh, there were many hospital emergents, but in particular one downtown hospital uh, the Wellesley Hospital, was simply closed down. And all of its uh, patient load was discharged to St. Michael's Hospital. Uh, the Wellesley Hospital served uh, a community uh, involving uh, a large number of uh, gay people. Uh, they didn't want to get their health services uh, from a Catholic hospital that regarded their lifestyle as an abomination. Uh, and also, of course, the new facility wouldn't undertake uh, the, uh, the reproductive health services, uh, particularly for, uh, for women. And the, uh, the deal that was arranged was that although uh, St. Michael's Hospital would retain its status uh, within the Catholic Hospital Association, uh, there would be a separate entity outside the hospital, physically outside the hospital, though financially administered by the hospital. Uh, that would not undertake these procedures but would refer to other hospitals downtown. And this was an acceptable uh, compromise. 
uh, that is, uh, the hospital would ensure through this non-hospital agency uh, that those uh, eligible for procedures the hospital would not participate in would receive them while the hospital uh, retained its status. Uh, but this is part of the challenge in areas uh, where an entire community is dependent on one hospital and that hospital declines to undertake medically indicated procedures uh, on grounds of uh, conscience. And this is a, a challenge that, uh, that we have to deal with. Um, one of the super first conscientious objection issues was around vaccination and immunization. And I'm wondering what you think, I mean, since you're here, um, about healthcare workers who refuse to be immunized Frontline healthcare workers, if you think. Yes, this is an issue that, that, that is coming to a head in British Columbia, uh, and it raises some, some uh, interesting uh, questions. If a, if a health facility, a public health facility, uh, changes the terms of contractual employment by requiring vaccination, uh, then we know under basic contract doctrine that the terms cannot be unilaterally changed by one party. Uh, and so existing staff members uh, would be entitled to object on religious or other grounds. Uh, there are, in, in fact, uh, demographic grounds uh, for uh, uh, refusing vaccination uh, on the ground that receiving the vaccine could be more harmful than the risk in the community at large because of so-called herd immunity. Uh, so any individual vaccination could be more dangerous uh, than uh, going unvaccinated and depending on others being vaccinated, uh, sort of a free lider question. Uh, but it could be a legitimate future term of employment uh, that one uh, undertakes a uh, vaccination. And that uh, feeds into the, the wider question of the grounds on which one tolerates immunities. Uh, again, the free rider uh, 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 proposition. Uh, and provincial laws vary on this. Uh, some say they would only accommodate religious objections to vaccination. Uh, others will accommodate uh, religious and philosophical and demographic uh, objections, that is, rational uh, uh, objections. And that varies from province to province. Uh, but accepting that terms of a contract cannot be unilaterally changed while the contract is in operation, uh, those already employed can be so-called grandfathered and allowed uh, to be unvaccinated, uh, whether they have to disclose to patients that they are a potential source of infection to patients uh, raises uh, questions of a clinical uh, informed consent. Uh, but it could be a legitimate term of future employment, uh, either renewed employment, uh, as in the, uh, 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 the Glasgow midwives case, uh, or a fresh appointment uh, that individuals accept uh, vaccination as a condition of uh, being engaged and, and salaried. I was very interested in your comment about the uh, pharmacist refusing to, uh, or just dispense. Yeah, could you speak? I've got to be engaged. I'm but not, pharmacists uh, refusing to dispense birth control? I, I'm sorry. You can't hear it. Pharmacists refusing to uh, dispense birth control? Um, one of the questions I have with respect to those particular medications, uh, they can actually be used for other indications like acne and whatnot. Um, and then there's some other medications as a side effect can actually cause problems with fertility, sperm count, ovulation. So I'm just wondering what are the limits in those scenarios of the rejection um, if the patient states they're using it for a different indication? Um, you know, is, is the conscience conscious objections applicable in those situations? Uh, it would not be applicable to uh, giving information. Uh, that is, uh, if doctors haven't disclosed the side effects, the secondary effects of their uh, uh, prescribed medications, uh, then the pharmacists should. And whether doctors can rely on the pharmacist giving information uh, raises questions uh, of the doctor-pharmacist relation. Uh, but pharmacists uh, do have professional obligations to disclose uh, the, uh, the side effects, the unintended uh, secondary implications of the drugs, and they have to inform the patients of that. Uh, and in that sense, uh, the pharmacists 
Uh, and this could, could be the justification for keeping certain relatively innocuous uh, medications on prescription so that the pharmacist, the so-called learned intermediary, uh, can uh, inform the patient, uh, the potential patient, of the implications of having or going without uh, the prescribed medication. Uh, so all of the secondary effects uh, that may be disclosed in the package inserts, but of course patients only read the package insert after they've bought the package. Uh, so pharmacists ought to disclose uh, the, uh, the unintended uh, consequences that certain medications may have uh, beyond the, the hopes that they will achieve their uh, therapeutic purposes. Uh, but if uh, uh, pharmacists refuse to administer, for example, uh, uh, methotrexate, uh, an anti-ulcer drug, because it can also be used uh, for abortion, uh, then uh, they, they have to uh, refer to others. Uh, and in that sense, uh, they, they can, unless the whole community depends on them, such as in the case before the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, but if patients have alternative recourse uh, to have the prescriptions filled, uh, then the pharmacists uh, can uh, uh, engage in their right of uh, religiously based conscientious objection. But that's separate from disclosing uh, the, uh, the uh, possible side effects. Methotrexate came to attention as an abortifacient drug uh, because of the package insert saying this should not be taken uh, by pregnant women. And of course uh, that was noticed that the drug uh, may, ter may trigger a termination of pregnancy as an unwanted side effect. Uh, but of course implied in that is that it could also be the very purpose of, of taking the medication. So before I ask you to join me in thanking Bernard, I will um, advise you that the next seminar in our series is Friday, October 12th. Our guest is Rebecca Cook, who happens to be the spouse of Bernard Dickens, <laughs> and they co-write much of their work. And Rebecca will be speaking with us uh, on the discriminatory effects of criminal abortion laws, prejudices, stereotypes, and stigma. Now, I did something unconscionable uh, earlier when I was doing my introductions, and that is that I mentioned Barbara but neglected to introduce Barbara Carter, who is entirely single-handedly responsible for the smooth functioning of this entire seminar series. Uh, and I We're also very grateful to Bernard. I had had a little taste in private conversation of what we would be discussing today, and um, I fully expected from that that it would be intriguing, informative, and challenging, and Bernard, you did all of that for us, and thank you very much.